So we're going to try another thermodynamics experiment today. What I have here is a pot on my electric stove top and it's filled with 500 milliliters of water. I filled it up prior to the video starting and I'm going to measure the average amount of power that my stove top is able to put into that water. And the way I'm going to do that is we're going to measure the temperature of the water and the time. And so what we'll do is we'll measure how long it takes for the water to reach a particular temperature and then using some thermodynamics we'll be able to measure the average heat transfer that's put into that water. So let's go ahead and get started with the experiment. Okay, so here we have the stove top with the water and inside the pot here we have 500 milliliters of water. You can see the temperature is at, uh, let's see if we can do that there, 15.9 degrees Celsius. And I'm going to go ahead and turn on the, the burner. I'll put it on high here and we're going to start the timer. And so we'll just see how the temperature varies with the time. Okay, so let's analyze the boiling water experiment. So we, here we have our pot with the water in here. So there's the water. And here's our cooktop. And I'm going to make the water my system. I'll indicate it by the dashed line here. And we have some energy put into it via heat transfer here. So I'll write it as Q dot in from the cooktop. Now there's no work being done on the water since there's no electrical resistor that's going into the water, for example, or any spinning, rotating shafts, you know, nothing like that, no piston acting on it, nothing like that. So what we're going to do is apply the first law to that water. So we have the change in total energy of our system, which is the water, is equal to the energy we put in via heat transfer into the water, minus the work done by the water on the surroundings. Now the change in total energy of the water is going to be comprised of the change in internal energy plus the change in kinetic energy plus the change in potential energy of the water. Now in this particular system our water is not moving around so we have no change in kinetic energy it's not changing elevation so there's no change in potential energy and we already said that the water is not doing any work on the surroundings so that term is zero as well. So what we're left with is the change in internal energy is equal to the energy put in via heat transfer. Now the change in internal energy of the water, we're going to make some assumptions to simplify that. So we're going to assume that the water is incompressible. I think that's a pretty good assumption because we're dealing with liquid water the entire time. I purposely stopped the experiment before the water went into a saturated liquid vapor mixture phase, so I didn't have to worry about any phase change. So we're assuming the water is incompressible and the specific heat of the water remains constant. So assume the water is incompressible and the specific heat of the water remains constant. Now that's a pretty good assumption as well because the water temperature doesn't change a whole lot in the experiment, so it's somewhere between let's say 15 degrees C up to about 100 degrees C. Over that range of temperatures, what is that, an 85 degree temperature range, the, the specific heat of the water will change a little bit, but not very much. So assuming that it remains constant is a pretty reasonable assumption. And with those two assumptions, the change in the internal energy of the water will be the mass of the water times the specific heat of the water times the change in temperature of the water. So in the end, when we combine the first law with our 
assumptions that water is incompressible and has a constant specific heat, what we end up with is the energy added via heat transfer will be equal to the mass times the specific heat times the change in the temperature. Just keep in mind that in order to get to this equation, we had to make a number of assumptions. We started with the first law. We said there was no work being done by the water. The changes in kinetic and potential energy were zero. And we assumed the water was incompressible with a constant specific heat. This particular expression isn't always true. It's only true for the assumptions I've made here. So just keep that in mind. The first law is true in general here for a system, but this is only true under the assumptions that I've given here. Okay, now let's go ahead and start putting some numbers in here. So as far as the mass of the water, I actually have the volume of the water as 500 milliliters. So 500 milliliters, milliliters is 0.5 liters. I'll write it with a capital L here. And 0.5 liters is 0 0.0005 cubic meters. The density of the water is pretty close to being 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter. So with those two things, the mass of the water will be the density times the volume, and that comes out to be 0.5 kilograms. So that's the mass of our water. The specific heat of water, I just looked this up in a table, and this, I looked it up specifically for the specific heat at a temperature of 55 degrees C. I chose 55 degrees C because it's somewhere in between the 15 degrees C and the, I think we stopped at just under 100 degrees C. So somewhere in the middle of the range there. Since I'm assuming the specific heat is a constant, I used a value somewhere in the middle just you know, to give us a good average value. And that is 4.19 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. It doesn't vary too much over the temperature range that we're dealing with. And as far as the change in temperature, the initial temperature was 15.9 degrees C. We saw that in the video. And the final temperature I stopped at just under the boiling point. So it was about 97.6 degrees C. Again, I got that from the video. So we can plug these numbers in, and what you'll get is the energy added via heat transfer comes out to be 171.2 kilojoules. And then what I really wanted was the average rate of heat transfer going into the water over this period. So if you just take that heat transfer, and let's just say that it's equal to the average rate of heat transfer, so I'll call that Q dot in. So Q dot is the rate of heat transfer, and then the bar over it means the average. And multiply that by the time, delta T. Now the time here was 320 seconds. That corresponds to 5 minutes and 20 seconds in the video. So then we can take that 171.2 kilojoules divided by 320 seconds. And so the average rate of heat transfer into the water over that period of time is about 0 0.5, I think it's 0 0.54 kilowatts. It might be, actually I think it's 0 0.53. Sorry, I don't have my exact calculation here, but I think that's what it comes out to be. So that's the average rate at which heat or energy is added to the water via heat transfer during this time period. Now, I looked up for my particular stovetop what the burner is capable of, that, that uh, electric burner, and it said it's capable of 100, I'm sorry, 1200 watts, so 1 1.2 kilowatts is what the burner is actually capable of delivering. Now you have to keep in mind when we did this calculation, this is the rate, average rate of heat transfer into the water. Now the burner may very well be delivering 1200 watts of power, it's just not that, uh, not all of it is actually making it into the water. For example, some of the heat transfer goes into the pot itself, so we have to raise the temperature of the pot. I didn't factor that into my calculation. Uh, there also might be some heat or energy that you know escapes around the sides of the pot. The other thing is there is actually some heat transfer of the water to the surroundings. So really what I'm calculating here I should probably put as a net. This is the net rate at which energy is added to the water. Maybe I should highlight that, to the water. The net rate at which energy is added to the water um, over that period of time. It's about a half a kilowatt. 
Okay, so anyway, we could do that calculation pretty easily from what we've learned in thermodynamics so far. All it took was a measuring cup and a thermometer and a stopwatch. So pretty straightforward. We'll end the example there.